Hermione, I think the bread basket moved. <laughs> <laughs> the bread basket is giving me hell here. I don't know <laughs> good. Well, when you're in Sicily, adjust your bread basket, I think becomes the new, becomes the new model. I'm trying, but it, but the bread basket keeps trying to, the bread basket keeps trying to cut me off. <laughs> If I had a nickel. All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Jeremy Cohen. I'm the artistic director here at the Playwright Center. Um, and on behalf of our staff, the people involved in that conversation, to kind of start exploring it and hearing where we're at and seeing, you know, kind of what, what work we can get done in the conversation. Um, I just want to give a particular shout out as part of the festival this year to um, uh, Trista Baldwin, Christina Hamm, and Matt Smart, who are three core writers with us here at the Playwright Center. Center and whose um, plays have been developed over the last 10 days. Uh, we've been thrilled to have them here. And I think very much those plays are um, emblematic of this, this topic we want to kind of dig into a little bit today for the next hour, which is that of epic theater. And sort of defining what that even means, it gets one of, it can be one of those really sort of objective, um, kind of reductive words that aren't particularly useful. So kind of getting much more specific about what that looks like and how we really, I think the conversation is probably a lot about how we sustain the vitality of our theater field, both here and abroad. Um, so um, I want to start by introducing the panel uh, that we've pulled together, uh, and then we'll spend a, a bit more time talking about this topic. Um, beginning to my left is Carlisle Brown. Uh, Carlisle is a writer, performer, and the artistic director of Carlisle Brown and Company, which has produced uh, his plays, Are You Now or Have You Ever Been? The Masks of Othello. The Fool from America, Talking Masks, and Therapy and Resistance. His other plays include The African Company Presents Richard III, one of my favorite plays ever, uh, The Little Tommy Parker Celebrated Collared Minstrel Show, The Negro of Peter the Great, Pure Confidence, A Big Blue Nail, and American Family, among others, uh, which was premiered here last year. Um, he's received commissions from Arena Stage, Houston Grand Opera, The Children's Theater Company, Alabama Shakes, Actors Theater of Louisville and the Goodman Theater. He's the recipient of playwriting fellowships from New York Foundation for the Arts, the NEA, McKnight, Jerome, Minnesota State Arts Board, TCG, and Q, and is the recipient of numerous awards. Uh, please help me welcome Carlisle Brown. <laughs> Carlisle is also a core writer with us here at the Playwright Center, as is Aditi Brennan Kapil. Uh, Aditi is a playwright, actress, and director of Bulgarian and Indian descent, having been <laughs> raised in Sweden and currently residing in Minneapolis. <laughs> <laughs> so you know you gotta love those plays. Her plays include Love Person, which is a four-part love story in Sanskrit, ASL, and English. Uh, Agnes Under the Big Top, um, which has been produced to critical acclaim both here in the Twin Cities and around the country. Um, Aditi's new hit Displaced Hindu Gods trilogy, which consists of the chronicles of Kalki, Shiv, and Brahmani, a one-hitter stand-up comedy show, is currently premiering at Mixed Blood Theater here in the Twin Cities. Uh, the final performance of all three plays, uh, the final marathon is this afternoon following the panel, starting at two o'clock. Join us um, here, or I'm so sorry, you guys can't join us from overseas, <laughs> but you're missing it, it's fantastic. Aditi's currently working on commissions for Yale Rep, South Coast Rep, and La Jolla Playhouse. Please help me welcome Aditi. Zach Berkman. Zach is a playwright, a director, a dramaturg, and a producer. He joined People's Light and Theater as uh, the Associate Artistic Director in September 2011 and has become recently the Producing Director uh, in 2013. Previously, he was the Co-Founder and Executive Director of Artistic Programming with Epic Theater Ensemble, uh, which is an award-winning theater company um, that's artist-run in New York City. Um, during his 10 years of leadership there, Epic gained a distinguished reputation for developing new work and cultivating diverse new audiences. His own plays include Beauty on the Vine, A Breath Short of Breathing, and The Harassment of Iris Malloy. Um, uh, Beauty on the Vine was produced in New York and Chicago and published recently. Please help me welcome the fabulous Zach Berkman. <laughs> Uh, joining us overseas um, on our upstage right uh, from the UK, Suzanne Bell. Suzanne is the new writing associate and dramaturg at the Royal Exchange Theatre in Manchester. She oversees the Bruntwood Prize for Playwriting, Britain's biggest uh, playwriting competition. She's recently worked as a dramaturg on new plays by Chris Thorpe, Rory Malarkey, Chloe Mosk, uh, Rona Monroe, and Simon Stevens. 
Um, she was the first literary manager to be appointed to the Liverpool Everyman and Playhouse, where she worked on critically acclaimed and prize-winning productions by playwrights including the incredible Jonathan Harvey, Frank Cattrall Boyce, and Lizzie Nunnery. She was the dramaturg on Unprotected, a winner of the Amnesty International Freedom of Expression Award. She supported the development of new work in companies including Frantic Assembly and Slung Low, and has run writer uh, and uh, okay, so that's all. So that's it. That's all I got. That's it. <laughs> it cut off. The rest of your bio cut off on my piece of paper. Please help me welcome Suzanne Bell. <laughs> there was more. I had to stop myself. I was so enthusiastic. I had to stop my enthusiasm for your bio. <laughs> um, and finally, joining us from Sicily, uh, Bryony Lavery. Uh, Bryony's plays include Her Aching Heart and A Wedding Story. Her play Frozen, commissioned by Birmingham Repertory Theatre, won the TMA Best Play Award, the Eileen Anderson Central Television Award, and was then produced on Broadway, where it was nominated for four Tony Awards. She also wrote Last Easter, produced at the door, and created successful adaptations of both Uncle Vanya and Christmas Carol um, as the associate artist for The Rep. Her frantic assembly piece Stockholm won the Wolf Whiting Award for Best Play of 2008, and her recent work includes Beautiful Burnout for the National Theatre of Scotland, and Frantic Assembly, which received a fringe first at Edinburgh. Uh, her play Thursday opens in March at the Adelaide Festival. Um, please help me welcome the incredible and the fabulous Bryony Lavery to our panel. So From Jewel, no, Minneapolis. <laughs> <laughs> We're all coming over for dinner in Sicily tonight. We're all hopping on a plane after the panel. The, the pasta sauce is on. It's ready. Come on. <laughs> Thank you, darling. So, all right. So, epic theater. Um, once I was in, a, uh, in college with Zach Berkman in a theater a history class that I failed out of twice. And <laughs> Zach didn't, which is why he's a much better panelist than I am. <laughs> One of the first things that I learned about, so I thought I'd go better go back to basic, was the idea of epic theater um, you know, being kind of, not developed, but being continued about 90 years ago by, of course, Bertolt Brecht. Um, and, and I was kind of reading some stuff recently as I was preparing for this, and this was, the, this was the part of it that jumped out at me, which actually I think jumped out at me <clears throat> a few years ago when I was doing so well in college. Um, <laughs> and of epic theater, he said this. To make transactions on stage intelligible, the environment in which the characters live have to be brought to bear in a big and in a significant way. When something seems the most obvious thing in the world, it means that any attempt to understand the world has been given up. He went on to say, what is natural must have the force of what is startling. This is the only way to expose the laws of cause and effect. It's all about a great change. The audience says, yes, I have felt like that too. Just like me, it'll never change. The sufferings of this man appall me because they're inescapable. That's great art. It all seems the most obvious thing in the world. I weep when they weep. I laugh when they laugh. The epic theater spectator says, I'd never have thought it. That's not the way. That's extraordinary. It's hardly believable. It's got to stop. The sufferings of this man appall me because they're unnecessary. That's great art, nothing obvious in it. I laugh when they weep, I weep when they laugh. So as we considered topics for the panel this year, we spent a great deal of time thinking about what challenges not only our playwrights in the field, but of course at the Playwright Center, because none of our writers, as much as we love them writing and developing plays here, no playwright is actually writing a play to be done at the Playwright Center, it's not what we do. All of the writers are writing plays to be done on stages here and around the country and around the world. So for us, we always have to think about our producing partners at theaters who are challenging themselves in these same kind of ways because of course they're the greatest allies that we have and partners and colluders and collaborators as we work with writers to think about where their work goes. One of the things we discussed recently is how the over 10,000 playwrights currently writing in the US are vying for approximately 250 slots a year on a good year. We continue to wring our hands, of course, at basic, basic survival issues like equitable pay scale, health insurance, ownership, and communication and expectation, always a challenge. Artistically, we probably spend the most time hearing from our cores and fellows, in particular about the shrinking landscape of theaters willing to produce plays of epic size 
and depth, both in terms of the actual scale of a play, cast size, design, the worlds of a play, will it be set in Antarctica or Iceland, <laughs> out on the fjords or not, but also in terms of what topics they're exploring within the piece. There's obviously a general sense that with funding shrinking, with audience, that with audiences less interested in paying for tickets, that by producing plays that either exist solely in the 20th century canon or produced last year in New York or London with somehow receiving a favorable, favorable review or prize stamp of approval, that of course that means that more audiences will come. And yet single ticket numbers will then skyrocket and order will be restored to all of our theaters. <laughs> Rather than deciding what stories are entirely critical to put on stage, the dramatic, the comedic, the stylistically challenging, the musical, the movement-based theaters, the devised work, the essential stories, we've become fear-based and responsive in our season curation oftentimes, rather than visionary and challenging, allowing only a modicum of risk into the palette of our theaters and our audiences. Um, I wanna share a couple of stories real briefly uh, one in particular, um, uh, which is that um, within, and these are these are both I would say within the last thirty days. So I tried to think of like not once I heard a thing, but here's a conversation I had in the last thirty days to just get really current about some things that are happening at least in the states. Um, one in particular was I, I was having a conversation with an artistic director about a couple of our writers, and, and they said, that's all, that's all great, that's really good for you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately, at our theater, we're really only interested in producing plays by writers who have had no less than 15 to 20 years of their plays being produced. And I said, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Not out of mocking, but actually saying, it's important to me, I want to understand. What does that mean to you? What is, how does that translate? When you have that conversation on your staff, when you're planning your season, what does that mean to you? And what the person said was that um, they were sure that within 15 or 20 years, that was enough time for audiences to hear them, that they would buy tickets to those plays, whether or not they were actually their best work or not, and therefore it was a much lower risk. And so I sat with this 15 to 20 year number as if audiences sort of we assume that they're sitting around at home like, I will go to this, I won't go to this, like they're doing math, which they don't do as it turns out, <laughs> and trying to decide which plays they were attending based on the exact number of years. Yes, I will go at 16 years, no, I won't go at 13. <laughs> I guess I just will. <laughs> Did you almost lose something? <laughs> Um, were, were you outraged? Is that what happened? Or did a blackbird fly through? I couldn't see. <laughs> outraged. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? So um, I, I want to say about this too, there's a, there's a number of other examples in the last 30 days, um, but I would just say that there's obviously no good guys and bad guys in this conversation. There's not mean people sitting around wishing ill and spite on people. There's a lot of people thinking about how to keep their theaters going and having great art in it just like there are an incredible amount of playwrights who write great work, and by the way, not every piece of theater that's written new is perfect and great, or perfect and great no. in every theater. We know all of that. <laughs> <laughs> is it different in the UK? Is every piece of theater perfect and great in the UK? Yes, yes. Undoubtedly. <laughs> it's not just because you sound smarter than us with that incredible dialect. It's because it's actually great. Of course. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Every British playwright <laughs> writes like Shakespeare's masterpiece. <laughs> Excellent. We're going to learn from you in that. Um, so I think there's a lot of conversation that we're having, which is then how do we take what is vital and remind our audiences, which is in fact why we're doing these plays, right? How do we take what is vital, which is gonna be very different for, from theater to theater, and put those stories in combination on our stage so that rather than saying, oh, hey, at X theater, we just like a play, we're gonna do it, which is also fine too, rather challenging ourselves as sort of, when, as, as producing theaters are saying it, to say, what is the bigger story that we're trying to tell at our theater? and not sort of saying, um, which is one of the examples I'm not sharing right now, I have X people in my audience, how do I only speak to them? But of course, how do I kind of balance that out with the conversation with, I wish I had 
less white people, I wish I had more young people, all of those kind of conversations. And yet the programming, in fact, doesn't reflect anything in its heart or scope that could open the doors further. So I think there's a lot of kind of conversation about how do we put vital work on our stage. So I think that's sort of part of our, our topic. So I guess this, I'm gonna ask an intentionally subjective question given the, fi given the five of you here. Um, and maybe Carlisle, we can start with you a little bit, but I'd love to hear from all of you about this. What kind of theater and storytelling do you find to be most critical to have on our stages today? I ask you as a writer, but also as an artistic director. Well, there was, a, there was an example you had from the past couple of months, which I was interested in addressing, you know, when you gave us some of these advanced questions, which was, you said that an, art, uh, an artistic director, particularly a young African-American writer, that he loved his play, but couldn't do it because um, it didn't reflect the interest of his white audience. And, and we know that's not new, but you know, that's disturbing in a lot of ways. And, and one is, uh, how does he know that? <laughs> and the other is, why is that? And why is he complacent about it? I mean, you know, as an artist running an institution, how does he view the nature of the social contract? Because, you know, I mean, even if he does, which has been the case, if he does that young black writer, <coughs> although I'm not that young black writer anymore, when one has artistic conversations, you never know whether you're talking about dramaturgy or money. And, um, and I think the way that that question sort of relates to, you know, when we say that there are no uh, good guys or bad guys, I think it relates to, you know, the example you gave from Brecht in terms of leptic theater is, you know, you know Alberto Uri is a bastard, Maxim Knight is a murderer, and Mother Courage, maybe she doesn't really have that much courage. Uh, but Brett shows us that they only exist because of an environment, a context. The only reason you can have an Alberto Uri is because there's a world that allows him to exist. And so, you know, well, are, are, you know, do artistic directors really have a social contract with the world? Because that example is, I mean, that's not the world we see right here in this theater. I mean, just sitting right here. It's just not that world. So the question is, what world is, are they looking at? Mm -hmm. and, and is this sort of like intellectual colonialism? I mean, kind of what's going on? I mean, there is something deeper. Yeah, definitely there really is. And I think there are positive things. And if I could take the time to kind of give an example of uh, an experience I had at Alabama Shakespeare Festival. Ken Thompson was the artistic director. It's in Montgomery, Alabama, and of course there's a diverse range of, you know, black people who can afford to go to theater, but there's, and he's trying to invite them in. You know, in this building that has this facade, which is historically tells black people do not enter. <coughs> but, you know, he tries to bring them into the theater and they do black shows, and then the black people, they only go to black shows. So, he, produced a play of mine to, and hopefully to try to solve that problem, and, and I'll kind of be brief with this. And the play was called The Negro Theater Grade, which is based on an unfinished novella by Pushkin about his uh, maternal uh, great-grandfather who was a godson of Theodore Gray. So it's one black guy, it's like Othello in a black world. He's, <laughs> he's, he was born in Abyssinia, he grew up in France. You know, he's like you, he's a, he's a global person. <laughs> and, uh, and he, and, and he, you know, and he, and he comes to, to Russia, like you came to Minnesota. And, you know, and, <laughs> you know, and, getting more and, epic by the minute. <laughs> and, and, and uh, you know, tries to belong, you know, but it was like, you know, Minnesota 20 years ago when it was just all blonde haired and, and sort of blue eyed. So anyway, um, it was uh, the company, the play had 19 characters played by 15 actors. Uh, but um, Alabama Shakespeare Festival could handle it because it, it housed a graduate acting program from the University of 
Alabama. So they had lots of warm bodies, good actors, but warm bodies <laughs> to do big scale shows. I mean, it was sort of economically reasonable. And they had a company, they had actors on salary. So that helped things financially. Right? Um, it was put in the smaller theater, right? Because, you know, nobody's going to see a play just because Carlisle Brown is on the marquee. And they also didn't really have a good idea who Pushkin was either. We couldn't really have <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, we put it in a smaller theater and, uh, you know, uh, we put together a production bu budget, which is not ambitious because we don't know if the white people will come or if the black people will come. And so, and then we have a workshop and get ready for rehearsals when the show will open. During the workshop, Kent uh, persuaded me to eliminate one of the characters. And when I went into rehearsal, the first day in rehearsal, the actors were all uh, talking about their backstories and you know they had really imagined the world of each of their characters. And one character said, I said, well, what, you, what about your character? And he said, oh, Gabriel Anastasevich, that's a, that's, a, that's a pretty common Russian name, isn't it? You know? And they all looked and said, that was kind of an inane thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we realized, as we talked around the table, was that he wasn't clear about who he was in the play because the character that I cut was his sister. Right? <laughs> and without the sister, uh, the thing that really sort of drives a plot is, you know, Peter the Great is an autocratic liberal. And he's going to take care of Ibrahim. You know, I'm going to make your life better whether you like it or not. You know, I know all you people of color, you've met folks like this. And, and um, so, but the problem was that it didn't look like a family. So right then I ran into Kent's office and I said, we got to put her back. You know, we have to put her back. And then Kent said some really like strange dramaturgical things. <laughs> and then I said, well, what's going on, right? Now, in the... In the smaller theater, which was like a big thrust, you know, you could have a minimal set, and that's good for the budget, right? You know, but it's a, it's Imperial Russia, so we have to demonstrate <laughs> that some way, right? You know, and that happens to be the costumes. And when I said to Kent, "What's going on?" He said to me, "Carl, those costumes are really expensive." <laughs> and so. Um, <laughs> And so this character needed two costumes. I mean, well, we had an actor who could do the double, so we kind of compromised, and we cut it from the first act, and because these costumes were crushed silk. So what I'm saying is that there are real problems, and he was sort of kind of trying to do it, but even when there's a willingness to make epic plays, you know, it's difficult. Right? And when there is no willingness or awareness of the social contract, then, um, Um, yeah, and I would just say, too, that the, uh, the conversation that I, I mentioned to you guys also was one of three conversations I've had in the last six weeks with uh, three uh, writers of color, uh, all of different races, all with artistic directors, all saying the same thing. So uh, that was sort of just one of them. Bryony, how about for you? What, are you? what are you seeing and what are you feeling as you're writing towards right now um, that you find to be really critical to, ha to have on stage right now? It's, it's quite hard to say. I think it's um, mostly it's about a very, very um, serious story that people connect with. I don't think it matters the number, the, the size of the cast or um, the, the, the size of the, um, the topic has to be huge. I think that's the only way I can describe it. What does huge mean to you when you say that? I see it in your in your face, in your heart. What does that mean to you? Um, it's you know a play is epic um, when wherever it is feels slightly bigger than it should. That that um, if you think about Hamlet, for example. Um, it's set in a castle, but the castle has a much more epic quality, and it's almost Jungian in that it's it's more than a castle. It's it's something terrifying. The same with the tempest. I'm I'm using old Shakespeare here, but the, the storm is more than a storm. 
Um, yes. Yes. So that's what I mean by. <laughs> yeah, lovely. And lest we, I mean, it's so interesting, and uh, Aditi, I'm going to go to you next. Lest we be careful with anything, I think, that we talk about, that is to say, this epic theater, which is my fear about ever coining something, uh, because it becomes, it's so objective, it doesn't really end up meaning anything. And it also becomes fetishized, as if to say that the only kind of valid theater is a theater of size and scope, which is actually, of course, not true at all. But I th so I think what I'm trying to do is, is with you guys to try to help us define the, the urgency about theater, which could be urgent comedy, but, and yet, what it, how do we help define it so that how do we help um, continue to either write towards it or hearing you talk about how you're writing towards it or why people are producing it or not producing it, I think, that, that kind of critical instinct. What, how about for you? Um, I'll kind of piggyback on both of these ideas. I think the social contract is hugely important. I feel like what's so essential is that we keep making a, an active conversation happen in theater between the audiences, between the theater that we are making. And that is, that is what an artist does in a healthy society. And making an inactive conversation that's sort of set, in, it's, it's dangerous. To me, it's dangerous. Um, yeah. For the big, I love big idea theater. I think big idea theater can be contained in a one person show. Um, it's not, <laughs> it, I'm gonna prove it too. Um, <laughs> um, I, think, I think it's about the soul of the thing and um, how, how you get at that is like, you know, your own deal as an artist. Um, but I do think it's important for us at, as artists to tangle with the big ideas and to be kind of fearless about that because otherwise we're not upholding our end of the social contract necessarily and that too is very dangerous. Um, What's the biggest, scariest, biggest, this is, oh my God, can the theater contain this idea of mine challenge that you've faced as a writer? Um, I feel like I got really lucky in that the first play I wrote, as I was writing it, seemed to me unproducible, and then people produced it. And I, that was, like all of a sudden I learned this lesson my very first time out, that theaters are actually, I think, more fearless than we sometimes give them credit for. Um, that said, um, I think the, the, I always have to have a conversation with myself at the beginning of any project where if it's not something that I think is incredibly important and valuable to put into the world and put into a dialogue with the world around me, I probably shouldn't waste three years on it because it will take me that long. Um, the trilogy that is currently running was scary for several reasons. It was scary for personal reasons. It was scary because I was tangling with mythic things, deeply personal immigrant experience things. Um, ideas that I wasn't done evolving for myself as a human and that I evolved by the way of, by way of writing the plays um, and that I then you know, took all my clothes off and went in front of humans and you know, presented to them for them to then engage in a dialogue with me about. So um, yeah, I, I think they're all scary to be honest, but I feel like that kind of is part of the job and I think, I think tangling with the big ideas is just hugely important and I think being okay with the epic failures is probably also <laughs> hugely important. Not okay, you're never okay with them. But you know, being accepting of them. Zach, you're both a playwright and also a producer, having worked at a number of different kinds of theaters and producing organizations with all sorts of different missions and stuff like that. Can you talk a little bit about how do you feel living in the middle of both? Like, and because they maybe are they the same yeah, for you no, or are they no, different? There's, there's a bit of schizophrenia about yeah. it. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's funny. It's funny because the the in this rolling, evolving definition of epic, having named a theater after it, I, I sort of feel a, a sense of responsibility <laughs> in some way. And yet, it came nothing from Brecht. The funny thing is, epic never did Brecht, not in any capacity. Uh, the origins of, of our name, which I sh sh um, cringed at throughout my entire time working there, because I always thought it was so highly pretentious, um, was uh, an Edward Bond quote that I'm going to completely butcher. But essentially, he said, an epic theater is when the personal and the political intersect in poetry. Mm -hmm. And our job throughout the time that I've been there, and I think it continues to be, is to support work, whether it's in the public schools or on the stages or in community, that has those three elements to it, where the personal and political intersect, and that there is metaphor, and that there is poetry, and that there is a love of language um, and text. So, 
been indoctrinated and immersed in that concept of ethic that I, I do hold on to and, and retain as a feeling of, of urgency when you ask me what kind of uh, work do I feel like I need to write if I'm writing it or I need to produce if I'm producing it. It is something that in my mind has a conspiracy to it. That there's a conspiracy between the artists and the audience. There's a conspiracy between the theater and its funders and the audience and the artists and that it all is together. That it is not a individual act of an artist trying to make a statement that a theater is supposed to support. Mm -hmm. It is a public dialogue that we're all agreeing to. And, and the funny thing about Brecht, and this is why I asked Aditya, so did Brecht ever get rich when he went to Los Angeles? Did he like, <laughs> it, is, you know, my notions of these things are that they take place in basements. They don't take place in penthouses. And the expectation of theaters that have been now ingrained for 50 years, or what have you, and have grown into institutions, multi-million dollar institutions, to be the ones generating the revolution, I think is, um, there's no basis in history for that. <laughs> So those institutions <laughs> respond and adapt to the revolution that's coming out of the conspiracies in the basements. So what I'm looking for, uh, you know, in, in my funny perch is, you know, who's wanting to start those conspiracies and is, is it something that I can help nurture towards me? And I'm in a different place now in a, in a mid-sized institution than I was in a fledgling, you know, small Broadway company. Um, we, were, we felt like we were in the basement the 10 years I was there, I'm not in the basement now. That's the, where the schizophrenia is more mm -hmm. coming from. I don't know if that really yeah, answers absolutely. it at all. But. Absolutely. Suzanne, how about for you? Because you've, we work both with a number of different writers on different kinds of <coughs> projects, but um, I think uh, obviously, maybe you can talk a little bit about the project that you're working on with Bryony currently, and maybe how that kind of responds to that nature of work. Yeah, um, so, I mean, one of the things I've worked previously in Liverpool when I was working there, we didn't have a small space. We only had a big, big spaces, 400 feet and 750 feet. The 750 feet that I work in now at the Royal Exchange, you know, we produce work that is demanding uh, it's 20 to 25,000 people to come and see it. And um, we want to put on new work. Uh, when I was in Liverpool, we put on new work, we put on new work, um, and I'm, we always talked about what does it mean to fill that space, what does it mean to write, typically. Um, we also talked about what does total theatre mean, and what does event theatre mean, which is quite a kind of fashionable phrase in the UK at the moment, event theatre, and why now, why here, why Theatre. Why are you writing theatre when you are sort of uh, competing with so many other ways in which an audience might be entertained, uh, whether it's live or, or you know cinema or box sets or um, you, you're, you're competing with so many different ways in which you might tell a story, and so it's really throwing down the gauntlet to playwrights to 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 demand that they demand a lot of the imagination of an audience in a live way. Why does this story have to be told in a live way? Um, and how does it surprise your audience? And what emotional journey are you taking your audience on? What impact do you want to have moment to moment? And what is the collaborative challenge that you bring a piece of work to life through which you bring a piece of li work to life with a director, with a designer. And we certainly find that the writers who rise to that challenge um, are the ones that audiences flock, uh, it, it, it create the work that audiences flock to see, um, that tell big stories, um, tell emotionally truthful stories. Whether or not those stories are rooted in our region or not. So when I was in Liverpool, we produced the European premiere of Yellow Man by Dale Orland Smith, sold out completely because it spoke emotionally, truthfully to an audience. And I think we, you know, we need playwrights to demand uh, the live interaction with an audience. That audiences are active, not passive. I really loved what Adidi said. You know, the audiences aren't passive. 
um, in a theatre. It's they're urgent and they're front-footed and they want their imaginations to be pushed and um, it's something that we're all really passionate about. And so <laughs> um, we we created what we called the Frontwood Hub, which um, the notion of which is is a partnership between six of the largest regional theatres in the UK across the north um, to work with playwrights, experienced playwrights, who who have experience of working in, in scale, scale venues to provoke and challenge them to write uh, work with the scope and ambition to fill some of the largest spaces in the UK and reach wide and diverse audiences, to speak to, to 25,000 critical imaginations. Um, and uh, we, we really feel incredibly fortunate and honoured that Bryony Lavery came on board as the inaugural associate playwright for the Hub um, because she brings such a huge range of experience She's worked in so many different ways, creating work, exciting work for audiences theatrically, and she, and so we gave that challenge, that aim to the playwrights that we were working with, and um, let them define the way they want to work. We said, this is the ambition. What do you need to to fulfil that ambition so that we can produce your work? And then from that, they created a manifesto which we could respond to, hopefully, with the aim of blowing their minds. I mean, that was kind of <laughs> the thing to do, was to go, well, you know, it's not about writing as... How, how are you engaging your audience's imagination? How are you surprising your audience? Um, and in the many different ways in which stories are told, why do you have to tell your story on stage? Why do you have to take your audience through a live, emotional story? Mm -hmm. and, and why? Just keep asking why. Why now? Why here? Why theatre? Um, and, and it's been, and it, it continues to be incredibly exciting to work with them. Thanks, Suzanne. Bryony, Did that answer your question? Yeah, a thousand percent. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Bryony, can you kind of just jump off on that? I mean, I, You've been set up, so I hope it. I hope it's not too much of a task. But I think you know what Suzanne was talking about is how do we identify artists to be at the center of these conversations or at the forefront of the conversation about the creation of that work, rather than the other way around, which is more the paradigm. Do you find in your own writing, obviously you've written some pretty searing portrayals of characters in the last couple decades. Do you find that in your writing? Um, you, uh, there, there are certain themes or certain approaches that kind of get you from that gut level into your work? Um, yes, but you never know what they're going to be. What, what Suzanne has been talking about, um, I've just been spending three or four weeks with these six, six playwrights, and we've done everything that's scared us utterly our biggest scare was having a choreographer um, take us out of our comfort zone and make us do dance. <laughs> I have to say we were terrific with it. Um, we, we had um, a professor of sculpture. We went and walked on all the big stages um, and had a look at uh, what the space tells us. Um, and it's, um, I, I think it, it, it's, it's all about... Utterly, I think it's what Aditi said, it's about utterly terrifying yourself that nobody is going to see it because you, you've gone for such a scene um, and then you discover that people are joining you in you know, whatever terrifying area you've stepped into and found the story of. Does that answer the question? I'm having a hard time completely hearing everything oh, here okay. in Sydney. Yeah, today. yeah. Can you, can you hear me okay now? Yes, I can. Um, I think a question too is then, you were saying why, 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 Suzanne, and I think it's such an important question. I think um, one of the things I know here in the Twin Cities that I've come to really value is that um, I think actors become writers and writers become directors and directors become educators and educators become writers. So really seeing that people are looking for what is my most vital 
critical way to tell the story. Um, Bryony for you, um, Carlisle for you, Aditi for you, you've also all been actors and performers. And I think about sort of, as we were talking about with, you know, Denai Guerrera and with Katori Hall and a number of other writers who say the same thing over and over. I wasn't finding, well, this is different variations of it, but I wasn't finding the roles or I wasn't finding the vehicle into doing it that was strong enough for me. So, so writing into it became that thing where I could tell those stories that I either wasn't seeing on stage or wasn't being offered on stage, but could, could get that urgency and really drive those stories out. I didn't want to wait for someone else to do it anymore. So I'm curious. If, I, yeah, 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 Brian. Um, I actually um, became a writer because I was such a really, really, really bad actor. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> That's epic, right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but you know, it meant that I discovered wonderful directors and, and actors who could who could um, uh, oh work and and of course you know it's such a collaborative act um, that the more collaborative you are, I think the more epic the work. Is. And I think it's that that's what's brilliant about epic theatre is is the challenge to collaborate to create work um the challenge that a playwright might throw to a director or to an actor to designers to a movement director um so one of the plays that we recently did at the royal exchange was a play a new play by a uh, 24 year old in a 750 theatre called cannibals um and the challenge to the designer was there was a fantastic stage direction in the theatre. At one point, the man walks on stage, he eats his hand, he eats his other hand, he eats his arms, he eats his legs, he eats himself with his ears. Um, there was a challenge to the audience. The final 20 minutes of the play, which was set in Manchester, were entirely in Russia. Um, audiences loved it. They totally got it. Wow. And they loved it. The fact that it wasn't anything that they recognized. Yeah. Was it because, I mean, right, there's the idea in the writing that it, when something is incredibly specific and urgent in that way, that the universal kind of reveals itself. Did you feel that was happening in that moment, in the, or those different moments? In, in the sort of emotional truth and the human story and the human journey, that's universal. And the specificity of that connects with people, I think. That's what I believe. It's emotional truth yeah. that connects with an audience. And that's what audiences want. They come to go, I feel that. Do you feel that? Let's feel it together and try and find a way through the world together. That's what I believe. So I want to take a moment to get some questions from you guys. We also have people potentially that are tweeting in. I'm so bad at all of this. I don't know if they are or not. Not so much. But let's let's take questions from you guys. Um, We're really alone. <laughs> um, and I think I'm, I'm curious about questions. And Hannah will come around with a microphone just because it's helpful for people that are, it's being live streamed to so people that are watching at home. And I think for these guys too. Um, are there what are what are the challenges that you're seeing out there as writers or as producers or whatever, and or what are the successes? Where do you feel like it's really working right now that we should be thinking about? Let everybody speak at once. <laughs> or questions about other stuff that that we're kind of talking about today. Or we can just keep talking. <laughs> Hi, I'm Krista. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> um, I, uh, this isn't 100% form, so bear with me, but as I, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about what you were saying, Suzanne, about emotion and, um, and this, you know, and, and the definition of epic. And I'm seeing certain stylistic things happen more, you know, in a bold way here. But what I, what I am not seeing is emotional uh, truth. Or not. I'm, I, I don't mean to be a bitch, but um, 
<laughs> but I, I feel like the, that I, I'm seeing that there's such a tempered quality that's happening right now in American theater with emotion. Um, it feels like the more people feel, the less it gets produced or, you know, there can be sort of bold stylistic choices or the, or the subject matter should be really interesting and should hurt us a little, but somehow it doesn't hurt. Uh, and so that's what I'm just observing, that somehow our theater never quite digs far enough. Far enough. So that's my restlessness right now. Mm. That's a good restlessness. Mm. Thoughts on that? It's so hard because it's so non-monolithic. I know we, we want to yeah. try to think of <coughs> regions, theaters, different things Hello? of having, what's that? Of, of having yeah. some sort of continuity. Um, and it's fascinating because I, 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 I love it. Walked into a space. This is almost your kid. Going yeah. uh, so, uh, and, and I, I kind of agree with. I mean, I think I really do agree very strongly with you that, there, that I'm not experiencing a lot of new work that achieves a sort of vulnerability and, and trans formative vulnerability on stage uh, that makes me um, lose, like go out of head and, and, and feel something different. Um, I don't know if that's a case of any of the fright flight kind of activity that goes on in, in the American theater. I don't know if that's a case of, you know, artistic directors are, are being scared of vulnerable work because I actually feel like I'm reading a lot of vulnerable work. There's something again in which that's not always translating into how that happens in production mm -hmm. and how an audience is prepared to have that kind of empathetic openness. We don't, as human beings anymore, want to be around people who are falling apart. Mm -hmm. We have a really hard time with that, and and we we and that fear of being responsible for someone else's emotions is part of our, the problem of our time. It's, you know, and, and, I, and I think um, Eric Booth, do you guys know who Eric Booth is? He's this wonderful arts educator, thinker. You know, he, he at one point said something about epic theater, but in theater in general, it's like, if you want someone to put down a gun, you're gonna have to give them something that is worthy in replacement of that to assert their power. Or, uh, and, and I sort of feel like now in a way, if you want someone to put down their computer or put down their personal device, you have to give them something that is so demanding of their need that it, it replaces them. Um, and, that's, and there's an urgency to that, but I, really, I pray for the emotion that people want to have, because you know you see it. I mean, I, I, you see it on television. Mm -hmm. You actually see people really go there, mm -hmm. and we're okay with that distance, mm -hmm. but something about the theater isn't mm -hmm. triggering that the same way. Well, I know it seems like the theater is a natural place to have emotion. I mean, you know, empathy, suspension of disbelief. I mean, you don't have to train anybody to do that. I mean, you put a kid or a dog on stage, and everybody goes, oh, you know, I mean, <laughs> it doesn't really take very much to kind of trigger that, you know? And, and I mean, and to, and to, make that, to make that happen in a play really requires process, because it really depends on the level of empathetic imagination that the broker who reads the play looks at. Right, and I mean, and, and the difference between, you know, real empathy and emotion and sentimentality, mm -hmm. you know, is a is a is a totally kind of, of difference. But, I mean, if you put it before an audience, they'll do it. We're we're just hardwired for that as stories. I mean, that's why we come to the theater because you know we need it. You know, you you put that's why you know I mean, you know, good at W. C. Fields didn't want to be on stage with no kids, right? Because they're taking all the attention, you know, because. But, do, so, but my question though is, I think we're talking about a conversation about fear and how much fear we're willing to sit within a theater and therefore the we being sort of as the, as, as a, or, 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 or people who are curating seasons, are you willing to sit within a fearful place with your audience or invite them in? Well, whose fear are we talking about? Well, I don't know. I mean, I think that's actually, I think there's a lot, I think there's a lot of fear. I think there's right. the fear that they won't come. I think there's the fear that they'll feel something so much that will they want to come back? Because of course, we're that, we, right? We, we, get, we 
move dangerously closer to the to that commodifying of they've got to come back, they've got to come back, they've got to come back, which of course they've got to come back. We need to sustain our theaters, but at what cost? I mean, I think that's the cost benefit social contract part of it that you were talking about as well. So where do we sit as a country? And I'm curious in the UK, where do we sit with how willing we're, we are to, um, to sit next to that really uncomfortable place? I mean, we, sure, yeah, we, yeah. we talk a lot at the Royal Exchange about um, artistic risk and we do have to find ways to balance the books. As you said, we can't completely bankrupt the theatre, but what is surprising is what audiences will respond to and do want to find ways to connect with stories. So it, it's it's not necessarily in the kind of conservative, safe theatre, the classical theatre that, that necessarily people would assume it is. Actually, it's about kind of finding other ways to tell stories to people that connect with a, met, you know, with a lot of different people. So if you look at the work of a company like French Assembly or Slung Low, they find very imaginative, memorable, and vital ways to tell stories to audiences that reach across different kinds of audiences and are ambitious and imaginative and theatrical and aren't safe. I mean, God, Slung Low makes you walk around outside cities for three hours um, and climb hills and staircases and, you know, kind of they take you out of the, the kind of safe sort of environment of a theatre. And if you look at something like um, Black Watch or, or Beautiful Burnout, Friday's Beautiful Burnout with French Assembly, it, it demands such a beautiful range of imaginative uh, collaboration with an audience. And, and I think sometimes, I don't know, like, do we shortchange our audiences? and think, oh, they only like conservative work, when actually they want ambitious, truthful work. When, yeah, to, when you know, we just this weekend, with the plays that I saw in Play Lab, you know, just contradict that whole thing. I mean, you know, the, there was work that was disturbing and dangerous and emotional and imaginative, and everybody in here loved it. I loved it. Did you love it? I mean, <laughs> it, I mean you know, it, it was great. I mean, a season like that, would be fantastic. I mean, I can't afford a subscription, but if it was a, a theater had a season like that, I would sign me some money to subscribe to it. You know, I mean, it's just not true. And I mean, the idea, it's heinous to think that like, I, I, you know, if people don't want to go to the theater to have emotion, if they don't want to be disturbed, if they don't want to discover something out of themselves, if they don't want to see different people, then they should bloody stay home and watch television. And, uh, you, know, the, uh, you know, certainly the writers I know are not writing for people like that. I mean, if you are that self-centered and narcissistic, you could save yourself some money, the 100 or $60 or whatever you pay for a theater ticket, and stay home and look in the mirror. I mean, the <laughs> idea that we have to kind of cater to that st stuff is deadening to artists. In some way, I mean, some way we have to be, because... We have to do what we do. And conversely also, playing into that as presenters, producers, as artists is deadening to audiences. Like if you mm -hmm. go to theater and you discover that you might as well have sat at home and watched TV, mm -hmm. then why would you go back to the theater? There's no reason. It's more expensive to go to the theater right. than to, to stay at home. So we have to demand more of our audiences yeah. mm -hmm. to make sure that it's worth the ticket price for, for them. And but we, we took, um, we took the, the hub playwrights round all the theatres and we had, at every theatre, we asked audience members to tell us what we liked and what we didn't like. Um, and they started off saying, we like something we know, and then we'd ask them to describe their most exciting thing. And they would say something that was completely different from what they knew. And, and <laughs> you, just have, <laughs> you just have to kind of trust that audiences 
can be challenged and love it. Yeah, amen. There's another question up here a moment ago. No? Okay. okay. Um, was, was there more about this, about sort of, I, I'm curious for other people who are at theaters who are struggling with the same challenges about, do you not struggle at all? Is it easy to put stories on stage? Do you not want those stories? Or, or do you want them all the time? And what are you, what are you hearing from audiences? Yeah, Elona. So at uh, at Company One in Boston, um, our entire season is this. I mean, what we've discovered is that, you know, we pre we play primarily to younger audiences, to more diverse audiences, not just ethnically diverse, but um, economically diverse audiences. And uh, we brought our prices way down last year, so twenty bucks to get in, and it's made uh, our ability to do epic theater even easier for us. I mean, not, it's never easy, right? As a producer, it's never easy. But um, because we're trying to build a, a vocabulary with our audiences so that it's not risky for them to spend like $60 to go see something they don't know nothing about, it's easier for them if they spend $20 or $6 and pay what you can. And they can see this new play we just uh, opened by Kirsten Greenwich called Splendor, which is 10 characters that spans 45 years of a uh, single town and like every single character is important and she was doing a really experimental form with it. We opened with that, we're doing We Are Proud to Present a Presentation, we're doing the flick, we're doing a live animation show later in the season. So all of these things have a kind of epic quality about them. And you know, I don't know how it's gonna turn out, right? You never know in advance of a season how people are gonna come, I mean, but it looks good so far. And I think that in some ways the, the building of the relationship with an audience so that they can trust you to put on something that is stylistically or emotionally humongous and not have to pay a lot of money for it means more people will come more frequently, I hope. Well, <laughs> I, I think we're seeing that, but yeah. you know, the And statistics. I think that goes back to your point, Suzanne, you, you use the phrase artistic risk, but I think that's one of those phrases that, like epic theater, that we have to be really careful of because we can say that and it means one thing to a marketing director right. who's actually trying to sustain that theater. It means a different thing to an associate artistic director. It means a different thing to the playwright who's in residence with you. I mean, it, it means really different things. I think, yeah. I think- You've got to be careful the, about general. Did you yeah. want to? Yeah. yeah. I think that the relationship with an audience uh, is really important. When, when I first joined the Liverpool Everyman and Playhouse, both theatres had been dark for a number of years and had gone bankrupt and had lost their audiences. And when we started producing work, it, we had to rebuild that audience. And by the, from 2003, when we started producing work again, to, to 2008, when Liverpool was European capital of culture, we built an audience to understand and enjoy and embrace new work, to, to understand the role of the writer at the heart of, of the work that we were doing. And um, that relationship is absolutely vital, particularly when you are um, outside of London and you are having a, a very strong dialogue with a community, uh, however large that community is or however diverse that community is. It is a relationship that we take very seriously because in Manchester and Liverpool, you know, our subsidy is from that community, partly. It's from the local government, as well as central government. And so it's vital that we nurture that relationship and, and, and surprise that relationship and surprise those audiences. And those are, those are the times that I, uh, my heart leech because I think, well, Yes, you think you want something that you recognize, but then let's give you something you think you recognize and then surprise you <laughs> and see what happens. Yeah, lovely, lovely, yeah, Christian. Hi, I'm uh, Christian Parker from the Atlanta Theater Company and uh, I was gonna say in Boston too, but it's not. <laughs> I was just thinking about the Red Sox. Um, uh, it's in New York City. Uh, I have two, two thoughts about institutions, actually, yeah. sort of springing from Brian's uh, observation or interaction with the audience who believed that they wanted something familiar, but actually when asked what they really liked or remembered, it was always something new and interesting that they hadn't mm -hmm. experienced before. And I think there, 
there are two things that, that are major issues that are facing established larger institutional theaters that I, that I struggle with a lot being on the inside of one, um, which is, uh, first of all, we don't do a good job of talking about the work that we're presenting to the audience in advance. Because because her, her observation to me suggests that actually what people crave is some um, point of contact or some knowledge or some insight into uh, the work that they may see yeah. before they get to the point of buying a ticket. And when I look around at um, how theaters with their meager budgets are marketing work, they're marketing to insiders. They're marketing to people who are already predisposed to come to that particular organization. They're marketing new plays to people who already like new plays. They're marketing um, a contemporary writer's work, um, even in the bios that they, they publish in, in press releases based on other plays that you would only have ever heard of if you already went to see that person's work. We're not talking about the, the work that, that exists in a way that sounds exciting. Um, to people who might not know your organization. And it's just that I think the institutions have to do a better job of actually sticking to their guns about the vision that they do have, if they have one, yeah. and find new ways to, to talk about it ahead of time and to, to make a compelling case for why they're producing the work that they're doing so that audiences will take an interest and then feel invited to the party rather than expected to show up at a, at a party that, that they may not they may not know how to behave at. You know, it's a costume party that they didn't know. You know, um, the other observation that I have about the, about institutions is that I think, and this is a much larger problem, and I have no solutions for it at all, but uh, is that we have developed such rigid producing models that there's no nimbleness in our programming, um, insofar as incorporating artistic risk in such a way that might mean you produce less work in a given year. Um, we're still so married to the subscription model, even though that in and of itself is dwindling, that we don't, we haven't set ourselves up in a position to do a play with 20 characters and therefore not do another, you know, to just slim your season down. That, that the self-perpetuation of the, of the institutions at their current budget size, with their current infrastructure, with their current staff, um, is such an implicit priority, even if it's not a conscious priority, that we haven't, we, we can't, dynamically interact with our audiences um, and, and produce a range of work. We, we, we're, we're married to six plays a year or five plays a year or 10 plays a year rather than being able to produce the work that we feel most passionate about even if that amounts to two plays a year. You know, we, just, we just don't have it. We, we can't do it with these larger organizations. And it's, I think it's a problem. I don't, you know. Yeah, and I, and I think that you know, like taking one's mission statement and making sure it really means something to you and marrying that with whatever our, our definitions of artistic risk are, and again, being wary of fetishizing risk as, and getting really, you know, sort of general about, like, who, yeah. like, I mean, right. for, I think people say artistic risk, and that means <coughs> there's just sex and violence and swearing on stage, yeah. and actually, I think that what we're getting at in the conversation today that I really respond to is, a, that Trista really kicked us off on is, our, or how comfortable or uncomfortable are we at sitting at what level of emotion right. or, and it could be it could be trauma as much as it is joy. Yeah. That we're, we're as, uh, I think the fear, part of the fear is I'm afraid to sit with your total joy <laughs> and ecstasy as much as I am your sort of internal crush. You know, I, it's, it, it's interesting. It, and yet we're, in the, yet we're talking about theater. We're not talking about sort of, film or something that, or it's an, a YouTube clip. I mean, it's, it's like we're talking about that thing where they stood in arenas and had a lot of emotion very frequently for thousands of people. Yeah, yeah I, I would eradicate actually the term artistic risk uh, because I think it's actually, it's now been so co-opted within the funding communities and the marketing communities that it, it, it now, that's part of why the funding communities are so obsessed with project support instead of general operating support. Yeah, I agree. Um, and because all I hear is how is this going to stretch your organization? How is this going to create risk? Grow, um, grow, 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 grow in a climate in which that's existing is risk taking. Yeah. Um, okay. And I, I, I really respond to what, what Christian was saying because I think you know the, the notions of epic and the definitions of epic when you're in institutions that cannot be in themselves epic, when they cannot take on those attributes uh, of expanse and poetry and, and radicalism, 
to then try to produce radical work, uh, it almost feels antithetical. It's like how do very conservative parents raise a child to be very progressive? They don't. The child gets away. They go to Oberlin and they, you know, <laughs> they, they, they find themselves away from that parent. Right? So, um, so I think that that's part of the, you know, the, the, there's wish fulfillment going on, but I think. When you're in a situation, whether it's the subscriber model, whether it's the idea of, of an eight-week, uh, you know, production framework of four weeks of rehearsal and four weeks of a run, um, you are undermining the ability of doing the most important, fascinating, meaningful work that you can do. When you're doing something that's plucking playwrights out of different places and plucking audiences, and those people are not part of the same world with one another, and they're not talking to one another you are innately undermining the dialogue that is supposed to be created between artists and audience. So it, 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 there, there is something antithetical, in a way, even about being here at the Playwright Center, uh, some places that have been around for 30 years and talking about creating radical things. It's kind of hard to do. On the other hand, the idea of the radical emotional experience, that can be done in any setting and should be continued by anyone that is around. So there's the, I feel really torn about the the nature of the conversation. Yeah. Since I still have the mic, can I say one more thing? Yeah. And then I'll give yeah. it to somebody else. I just, because I, I was thinking, you brought up the funding community, and I think there's something, uh, as I see it too, that there are, there are a couple of things that are really having a, um, a, a deleterious impact, I think, on the, on the proliferation of, of risky or really ambitious epic playwriting. One of which is that, that the foundation community, to some extent, has, has uh, prioritized uh, world premiere funding and uh, emerging artist funding so much uh, in the past couple of decades that w it has prevented really exciting work uh, that has been produced, whether, whether by emerging writers or more established writers, from getting subsequent productions. Um, uh, that's changing a little bit with, with certain, you know, things like National New Play Network and all, and all that, but, but it's, it's a, it's a problem, I think. The, the other thing that, that is true about um, uh, the, the funding community is that we, because of this, um, uh, I, I think it takes a long time. It's just linked to the same idea, I guess. But it takes, you know, some uh, writers develop, you know, develop their voices over time, in my experience, and, and can sometimes get more and more ambitious as they go. But if they're not being, um, if they're not able to, to be kept in the theater world um, by the support that, they could, that the, the funding community can offer them, uh, they're not necessarily going to get to the point where they're writing their most ambitious and most epic work, because they're going to leave it for something else. They're going to leave the theater for something else. And by, by so privileging the earliest work, um, of young artists, I, I think we're missing the boat on, on supporting writers who are further along in their careers sometimes. Can I, can I just ask Bryony, uh, as, uh, we asked Bryony to be our associate playwright because she has over 40 years of experience, sorry Bryony, uh, of writing for theatre. 257 um, years of experience. <laughs> <laughs> of writing for theatre and hasn't, and has sustained that and hasn't disappeared into, you know, TV and film. And, and that was one of the reasons we really wanted Bryony to be our inaugural associate playwright because the writers that we are working with are being chased by TV and film and want to remain in theatre and want to write for theatre, but they have bills to pay and rent to pay. And Bryony is that, that person who's done that and is that mentor and is able to, to show them that. And so can I ask Bryony to respond? Yes, um, you have to make sure that you, you have to prepare yourself to be sometimes very, very poor. Um, I, can you hear? Yeah, yeah you're good. Yep. Okay. Um, I realized quite early on in, in England, you start off uh, that, that in medieval times, you were a jester in a court and you had to entertain. Um, and if you didn't and they didn't like you, they cut your head off. 
And I think you have to decide if you're going to be a writer in theatre that you you might be very poor, you know, you might be very unpopular for a time. Um, but what you will get is is the most thrilling spaces to work and and make stuff. Um, was that the question? Was that the answer? <laughs> I think so. Yeah, we'll figure out a question. <laughs> you, have to understand, you have to be understand. I I have been up for eighteen hours solid. So if anything sounds <laughs> off, that's why. Um, well, we need to kind of move towards wrapping it up. Um, last. Last comments or thoughts or last um, yeah. Yes, Adam? Okay, great. Um, so um, this is totally uninspiring, but I, 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 I was joking with a friend of mine recently, uh, uh, Mara Isaacs, who used to be at the McCarter Theater for almost 20 years, um, and she was, she was talking about um, the moment where she arrived in New Jersey uh, to work at McCarter, you know, sort of 20 years prior, um, and she was saying, what I remember about the slogan when I moved to New Jersey was, uh, and uh, that, that they had put out um, just after she arrived was this, New Jersey arts, colon, better than you'd expect. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so sad in a way, and I love New Jersey, bless their hearts with all their marriage uh, quality, but... Um, uh, I think I, I'm a little that's terrified. I think that's my nightmare, right? Is that I wake up and there's bumper stickers about the American theater or right abroad that we say sort of the theater field. Well, it's better than you'd expect. <laughs> and, um, and I think that has so much to do with the conversation that we're all talking about today in these things, which is about, it. Do, you know, put away the word epic, put away the word risk for a second. And just how do you live into... Um, that deeper place, and how do we learn to move fear aside as producers, as writers, as theater makers, and live into the place where we say, we can do our most vital work, and we have to believe that the people will come. We just have to believe it. You just have to have that kind of spirituality about it, because if you, if you are approaching it with that level of authenticity, I think that then you trust you are part of a larger conversation, and not one that's just part of a sort of you know, zero-sum, commodity-driven cycle. Um, it's scary, and I think you said it best, Brian, which is like, you better ready, be ready to be poor and disappointed some of the time, mm -hmm. but a lot of the time you're going to meet amazing colleagues like that. this room and this, uh, you know, these screens are full of right now, and like so many of our great colleagues in the field, there'll be a lot of wealth in many other kinds of ways as well. So um, thank you all so much. Please help me in thanking our panel for today. <laughs>